Hello, my name is Iman Aoun. I'm the artistic director of Ashtar Theatre in Palestine. And I am Edward Maalim, the general director of Ashtar Theatre. We found Ashtar Theatre in 1991 to be the first theatre school for youth in Jerusalem. And then it was spread out in the West Bank and Gaza. Since then, we've been working with young people at schools and universities and with their teachers as well. We've been working with the theater of the oppressed, with community members, and with professional actors. The play Oranges and Stones was produced in 2010, directed by Mujasola Adebayo. Since then, the play is still touring around the world. In 2017, we retook the play for the centennial of the Balfour Declaration. The play has no words. We hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.
sound, checking the sound. Hello everyone, and thank you for watching uh, Oranges and Stones by Ashtar Theater from Palestine. And thank you for staying for the post-show discussion as well. This is the fifth GLOD political theater as a civil right episode. GLOD is a fortnightly online platform presenting political theater from around the world. And it's hosted by HowlRound Theater Commons. My name is Sinziana Kojokarescu. I am co-artistic director and co-founder of Besna Theater a British-Romanian political theater collective devoted to challenging institutionalized and normalized violences in our society through theater. Today, I am joined by the two actors you've just watched in Oranges and Stones, Iman Awun and Edward Mualem, the director of the piece, Mojisola de Bayo, and former UN Special Rapporteur for Palestinian Human Rights, Richard Falk. Um, I want to remind people watching that you can donate to the presenting company by following the link that pops up. And if at any point you have any questions for the panelists, uh, you can send them to us by email at contact at besnatheater.org or by commenting or messaging directly on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and now I'd like to give it over to our uh, panelists. Uh, and if you want to uh, introduce yourselves, I know I've, I've said very briefly a few things about you, but if you want to talk in more uh, depth about uh, Maybe we can start with you, Iman. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for this wonderful hosting. Uh, we are really happy to be uh, with GLOD. Uh, um, and I'm Iman Oon. I'm the artistic director of Ashtar Theatre in Ramallah. And um, I mean, I am an actress my, myself and a director. So uh, I live in Jerusalem. But I work in Ramallah, but and also in uh, uh, in the West Bank in general. And uh, Edward. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name is Edward Malim. I'm an actor. I started uh, acting uh, when I was 15 years old. I'm a founder of El Hakwati Theatre Company, and in 1991, me and Iman we co-founded uh, Ashtar Theatre, and since then. I'm the director for the theater, the general director and actor and trainer in the Atashtar. And Mojisola? Yeah, hello. It's great to be here. It's a real honor. Um, Mojisola Adebayo, I'm a theater maker, a theater artist, and I don't really mind um, which part of theater I'm kind of working in. So sometimes I direct, I write, I act, I produce, I perform and uh, teach sometimes. Um, yeah, and I have worked with Ashtar on a few different um, theatre productions and it's a, yeah, a great honour and a joy to be here um, with them and with all of you. Thank you. And Richard? It's also wonderful for me to be with you all and it's uh, a great honour to have uh, witness this very uh, fascinating uh, po political theater, which is uh, at the experimental frontier and very moving in its own special way. I'm a uh, pr professor of international law, taught for many years at Princeton University in the US and have, and currently um, uh, holding the global chair, the, the chair in global law at Queen Mary University, London. And if it were not for the uh, pandemic, would be uh, there in London probably at this time. But even at this distance, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard. And it's a pleasure to have you all. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Like I said before, it's an absolute honor uh, to have you all uh, in this panel. Um, I'd like to start with a couple of questions addressed to the team of Oranges and Stones. Um, so the first question would be, um, why have you chosen to tell the story of the Balfour Declaration without words using physical theater? And that's open to the whole team. Anyone can jump in and, and answer if you wish. Which is all I can start. <laughs> um, Maj, would you like to start? 
Okay. So, <laughs> so um, I think that um, one of the things uh, that um, silent theater uh, is presenting is the depth of, uh, of the issue. Um, it is louder to present something without words. Because if, if we would have put words on the, uh, or in the play, uh, we would have needed volumes of, uh, of words and, and of text. And it won't be as accurate and as uh, precise uh, as the gestures, as the mm -hmm. um, movement, as the um, items um, that we have used. Because every single movement, every single look, every single object on, on the stage had been um, studied, tested, and um, presented with meaning um, and with um, purpose. Do you want to add anything to that, uh, Mojisola? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with Iman. And um, yeah, we would have needed volumes and volumes. And volumes have been written and volumes have been spoken um, about occupation uh, in Palestine and beyond, um, but sometimes I find um, the layering of language obscures um, some very startling realities, you know, that, um, and one of the ways in which occupation can be made to seem very complicated is through language and through the inadequacies of language and the manipulations of language. And I'm a language lover, I'm a poet as, and a playwright. And I, and, you know, I usually use words. Um, but sometimes in political contexts, language can be um, very loaded, very manipulative. And sometimes a deeper understanding comes from just sort of seeing an image. And I also the piece, um, you know, was an idea I had after working with Ashtar uh, and, and work, having the privilege of working in, in, in Palestine uh, quite a lot. And um, I just had this frustration when I came back to England after working with Ashtar very many times and, you know, and people not understanding or not, not resonating with how I would describe the situation. So I say, you know, the Palestinians are living under occupation and... The word occupation has very little um, emotional resonance in the English language anyway. It has very little weight to it, it has very little gravitas to it. If you say a word like apartheid, it has certain gravitas, certain resonances, certain associations um, that are emotional. And that, you know, basically a toilet is occupied. My occupation is theatre teacher, whatever. Um, and that people didn't sort of kind of respond to this idea. So the idea was that, okay, if you could if you could see a picture of what occupation looks like and imagine yourself in the shoes of somebody who's living under occupation, then you may well have more empathy and you may start to ask some questions of the ways in which you've been communicated about this situation in the past. Um, so, and you know, and theatre is the art of empathy. Uh, and sometimes it's easier to empathise when you, when you strip, strip things away and, and see a situation and imagine yourself uh, in, in somebody's shoes, which is which is what theatre is kind of for. Um, so it's to yeah to try and take what is seemingly a very complicated situation and actually br bring it to its kind of essence, um, if if that's if that's possible. That's the ambition anyway. Yeah, ab absolutely. I I resonate with you completely on the idea that. Um, language can obfuscate the emotional reality sometimes and that the political reality as well and that it can be a lot easier to just show uh, pure pure emotion the conflict of emotion between two people without um, without using words and I think you've done it very successfully in the play and I have to congratulate you all for such a beautiful um, poignant and heartbreaking piece of work um, it was not easy. <laughs> It was really very hard for us to, to act without words, to use our body only. And every movement has a meaning, so we, went, we had to work very precise on every movement with Bujisola. And thank you, Bujisola, for that. Had you done a physical theater before, or was it your first time? 
it, it, we do physical theater, but it was first time doing theater without words. Mm -hmm. Let's say we do use our body, body. Yeah. Uh, we do use image theater because we are also trained um, uh, theater of the oppressed actors so mm -hmm. uh, theater and uh, and positioning and uh, um, multi-layered understanding uh, of uh, of an image uh, is part of our um, understanding for what theater could could yeah. really present mm. And how did you how did you um, work without uh, words? How did you did you do a, did you have a d different process than you do usually, uh, both as actors and you, Mochisola, as a director? Um, yeah, I, I um, when we first created the the show, which is many many years ago now, um, Edward has a fantastic memory for years, so he was telling you ten years ago. <laughs> I get it, ten years ago. Wow, and it's been touring um, the world ever since. Um, and credit to the actors and Ashta Theatre for that. Um, it's just incredible to sustain that and the pain of it as well. It's a deeply upsetting piece of work. Um, so respect to the actors for, for keeping going and keeping doing it and making it more and more beautiful in it, every iteration. Um, but yes, um, when we developed the piece 10 years ago, um, I brought in some some experiences that I'd had. My, some of some of my training is in physical theatre, but this is a different kind of thing because it's not about um, a kind of muscularity. It's about a clarity, and it's also about stripping away and letting go, actually, of 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 a kind of over expression. Um, and so I think that's one of the challenges of the piece is um, to to not kind of make it into a kind of mime show but to, to let go um, and trust um, that when a glass is handed or uh, a stone is picked up or an orange is peeled, to, that trust the clarity of the image and uh, trust that it speaks and, um, and trust the audience to, to, to kind of be drawn in. That those, that those are really difficult things. It's much harder then doing incredibly kind of physical kind of work and throwing yourself around the stage, you know, um, if you're if you're fit and healthy, that stuff, you know, that's that's technique and training and athleticism. But actually, to let go um, and to hold um, the story within and the image within yourself, in a sense, and trust uh, trust the trust the image, trust that you don't have to try and push uh, communication is is extremely difficult, much more difficult than it looks. And so one of the things that we use was we, we draw, I draw on some training that I had done with Philip Zarelli, an American director, um, using uh, Samuel Beckett, very influenced by kind of Samuel Beckett, which is kind of requires an actor to kind of let go and um, some kind of mind body uh, work very much influenced by Buto, the Japanese um, dance uh, form, or dance form that's kind of based on walking really and very slow, very meditative work. Um, but the actors themselves, you know, they, they bring in their own, those are just a few things I brought, but they also bring in their own training, um, which is extensive. And, and you know, they've been making theatre for, for longer than I have. So, so they, they also brought in their, their, own, their own skills and, and, and brought things to it that I, I you know, I, I can't sort of name, but they can. Um, just to add um, few, one more sentence, maybe um, that uh, in this work there was a big group working on on the show. It wasn't only uh, Edward uh, in 2010. I wasn't there. I, I just joined in 2017. So, uh, but uh, my colleagues uh, Riham Shah, who was playing uh, the, the role uh, that I took, um, Rasha Jahshan, Muhammad Aid. Uh, I mean the names that that are of uh, of beautiful wonderful actors who were there in in the um, in the rehearsal room in, in the laboratory uh, uh, work uh, with Mujisola um, and then it, it was like a community that created uh, such a strong um, ideas and and uh, positions and and images and, and meaning and uh, presentation so just wanted to 
refer to to the work of everyone <laughs> <laughs> and of course the work of um, uh, of the musician uh, Rami Washaha was also a character in in itself uh, by itself uh, it was a strong presence uh, without sure. uh, his music uh, that guided uh, the line that that were talking to us on stage all the time uh, we wouldn't have managed uh, really to present the, uh, the the work the way we presented because that was the talk that was the inner um the, the feelings spoken out through the melody absolutely and that 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 is very present in the piece that is uh, that is very uh, strong um what you saw you mentioned at some point you know that deliberacy that is needed you know to to pick up a stone to and peel an orange and that actually leads me really nicely to one of a question that I wanted to ask. And I feel, I think that some audience members who are not uh, familiar with the situation in Palestine may ask themselves, why oranges and why stones? What, what do these mean? And I will want to open this up to um, everyone, including Richard, if you want to jump in uh, to talk about these two symbols. I think it'd be fascinating to hear, to hear uh, Edward um, talking about, about that, you know. Um, what do you, why oranges and stones, Ed? Uh, well, uh, but the play was called 48 Minutes for Palestine. And then we had, we changed it uh, in 2017 to Oranges and Stones, because what is in Palestine, oranges and stones. The most that you can see in Palestine are the oranges and the stones. And the oranges and the stone, they, stones, they can tell the story of Palestine. <laughs> now, more, um, more so is also the oranges are symbols also of Jaffa and the land, uh, and the land that was um, stolen in, in 48. So um, it was occupied by the Israelis. So um, we lost uh, the ranches, we lost uh, the food, we lost the beauty, we lost uh, the, the fruits. Uh, so the fruitful uh, part of Palestine was occupied and, and that is the symbol of uh, of the orange the stone uh, is the, also the simple the symbol sorry of um, uh, struggle uh, of the intifada it, it was the uh, the, the first only, uh, the only the only thing that we had yeah it was it was the first and the, and the only uh, way to resist through uh, these stones when when the young people uh, used the stones to throw uh, against um, uh, tanks and and uh, artillery and and soldiers so um, so these two are real uh, strong symbols that uh, that we live with um, yeah. that's why we have chosen that word or these two words sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and I'll, yeah. I'll add uh, one thing to that which is very poetic and eloquent description and it's absolutely yeah, yeah I mean yeah, absolutely, and just and, and also in the theatre process itself, um, we when we created this show, um, uh, we, we didn't have a budget. Um, sometimes we're very fortunate and we get funding, and other times and we don't. Um, but we keep making theatre, what, whatever the circumstances. And Ashtar are incredible at just at, at doing that, at, at being incredibly uh, resourceful and creative. Um, yeah, so we didn't have a budget really, and. Um, but we needed to, uh, Ed said to me one day, you know, we need to create, we need to define the space somehow. We need to define the stage. We need to know where the beginning and the end of this stage are. And um, I was just wandering around outside Ashtar Theatre in Ramallah and I thought, well, there's a lot of stones. <laughs> there's a lot of stones around. And oranges are, are in when they're in season, are incredibly cheap. So just bought a massive bag of oranges and started playing around with them and the stones. So it's also about being resourceful as a, as a theatre artist when you have very little. Um, uh, and uh, what was so beautiful was I remember the day when we put those oranges out and they're like light bulbs. They're like, they're, you know, they just kind of, they fill the stage with this, uh, with this colour and light uh, and, 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 the, and, and the contrast between them and the stones, I think, kind of works really well. So it was also, um, it was political, it was poetic and it was also economic. Uh, the holy trinity of theatre making at the grassroots, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Richard, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I mean, uh, all of you were very eloquent and uh, expressed better than I could have uh, what the essence of the 
theater experience was. And I think the choice of stones and oranges, as was suggested, is the most transparent way of achieving uh, this focus on the essence of the injustice and the uh, resistance to that injustice. And for me, uh, the stones have so much been associated with the uh, perseverance of the Palestinian people against the ordeal of occupation and the prolonged ordeal. It's, it's a, uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, narrative of both tragedy and a sense of uh, spiritual strength. And uh, it has inspired many people, including myself, uh, to witness uh, this uh, kind of uh, flame that won't be extinguished. And uh, uh, that's a, a very powerful experience. And I think the transparency of these uh, symbolic images uh, is, as has been beautifully said by the director, uh, so much uh, more, uh, uh, com it communicates so much more uh, vividly and uh, in some strange way linguistically uh, than reliance on uh, language as we generally understand it. So I think that's what provides this theater piece with its special magic. Thank you, Richard. Um, I wanted to ask you as well. I mean, we, you know, Mojisoa, you said it that sometimes it's difficult to explain things to people who uh, are unfamiliar with the political and emotional reality in Palestine. Um, but I'm sure that we have audience members who perhaps don't know what the Balfour Declaration is or what occupation actually ent entails. And I would like to ask Richard, if you can, to um, explain plainly for our audience what the Balfour Declaration actually did for Palestine and what is behind the scenes of this emotional piece that we've watched. Uh, well, in brief, I think the Balfour Declaration was the pledge by the uh, British Foreign Secretary at the time, uh, Lord Alfred Balfour, uh, of support for the uh, Zionist project of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Note, it was support for a homeland, not a state. And that, uh, that distinction is often lost. It also uh, has always, for me, epitomized uh, this uh, last stand of colonial arrogance, uh, the notion that uh, one would decide the future of the Palestinian people, whether uh, the uh, Arab majority or the Jewish tiny minority at that time, which was about 8 to 10 percent of the total population of Palestine, whether that uh, that kind of colonial arrogance would override the will of the people that were living and had been living for generations in the land. One understands that the background uh, that is familiar to most people, probably including the audience, was the uh, Jewish experience of the Holocaust. The Balfour Declaration, of course, preceded by uh, uh, 20 years, uh, what uh, the genocide that occurred during the Nazi era. But the two things get merged in a very confusing way and very little uh, empathy is placed on the Palestinian end of this experience. Uh, why uh, the European countries and also uh, the North American countries, particularly my own, the US, did very little 
to obstruct uh, Nazi uh, atrocities. And the Palestinians, of course, did nothing to cause those atrocities. And yet they are paid the price. And they also uh, were used by these liberal democracies as a way of uh, assuaging their guilt for not doing more. And again, the Orientalism of making a uh, non-Western people pay for the crimes of the West is a, itself a powerful, uh, not exactly image, but it's a powerful reality that has been repeated in many other uh, contexts, maybe not as vividly as in Palestine, but it's characteristic, I think, of what uh, the colonial uh, mentality imposed on uh, especially uh, Asia and Africa over a, a long period of time. And uh, I mean, the one other thing I would say is that Zionism uh, had the challenge of trying to uphold this sense of being uh, democratic and not uh, uh, not violating international norms. And the only way it could do that and still establish a uh, Jewish mandate in Palestine was by ethnic cleansing. So you had this need, uh, given the, part the, the partition uh, that came much later of Palestine under UN auspices, disregarding once again the will of the people that live there uh, and, and creating the political necessity to get rid of the Palestinians who were in the uh, part of Palestine that was allocated to uh, the Jewish uh, uh, emergent state. And so one has this remnant of colonialism at the very time historically when colonialism was collapsing everywhere else in the world. And the only way to make that kind of project work is to be extremely coercive because no people in the 20th century, middle of the 20th century was going to accept the idea that colonial rule was still a valid way of governing a people. So you had it built into the beginning of the, uh, the post-Balfour reality, a dynamic of resistance and repression. And that goes on as we speak. And I should stop speaking. <laughs> I could listen to you for hours, Richard, you know that. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I wondered if anyone else wanted to add something to what Richard has said. Well, I think um, Richard had, had put the whole idea uh, in such a thorough uh, way. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that, um, as, as he said, it, it is a colonial um, project that uh, one of the most unfortunate um, matter is that the whole world, the UN on top of everybody else, uh, do not want to listen to the people. Oppression had been um, uh, established in, in this uh, part of, uh, of the world um, since um, 1996, um, after the uh, Zionist um, uh, 18. Uh, sorry, 18, I mean, 1896, after the Zionist uh, um, uh, Congress, the first mm. Zionist Congress, when, when the, the beginning of, uh, of the Jewish immigration uh, have started into uh, Palestine. And the Palestinians started to raise their voice, started to say something wrong is happening there, but no one wanted to listen. And there's still 
happening the same thing. I mean, what we are facing today uh, with, uh, with this, what they call peace, the new peace uh, uh, agreement between Israel and, uh, uh, and the Emirates uh, is another chain of, uh, of that uh, history and that story. So um, un unless the Palestinians would have uh, the rights, full rights, rights of return, rights of uh, um, having their own country, uh, um, the right of um, um, of choosing uh, what they want, um, then there will not be peace uh, in this land. And and so the world really need to uh, be bold for once and to um, to stand in the right place and to stand with the uh, oppressed people and not to clap for the oppressor. And that's the problem. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Iman. Um, I wanted to ask um, you and Edward actually, um, in Palestine, how vivid um, is this idea of British colonialism? Because, of course, uh, before it was uh, before the Balfour Declaration, Palestine was a British uh, colony. So, how how present is that in people's minds? How aware uh, pe people are, and um, how much accountability do you think? Uh, do you, sorry, I'll rephrase that. How much do you think the British Empire? is accountable and should be held accountable nowadays? We believe that um, the whole, not only uh, the British, but uh, the whole uh, international community should be held uh, accountable. Of course, Britain on top of it, uh, France as well, the US, uh, but also what is the EU uh, doing to us at the moment, uh, trying to impose uh, political um, uh, um, I mean, a, a political uh, agenda on uh, on the way they would help uh, the Palestinian sure. and and support the Palestinian uh, community is another um, episode of the same thing. Um, I mean, uh, after the Holocaust, uh, the the Germans have paid trillions for the uh, for the Jews uh, and for Israel per mm -hmm. se and and they still are but um, but UK uh, Britain did not pay a penny for the Palestinians uh, in uh, in return to the Balfour declaration and to what they have done so uh, the uh, conspiracy uh, or or the um, political will um, of the Western world, uh, was from the beginning to impose Israel here because they wanted um, a country that would that would become the police uh, in the Arab world in order to stop the Arab um, um, nation of becoming one strong uh, ally yeah. uh, and uh, to keep the uh, controlling the resources, the petrol, uh, and now the gas and let's that would bring me to uh, the the fact that Israel uh, had put Gaza for 14 years now, 14 consecutive years, imprisonment and in siege, only because there is gas on the shores of Gaza, because they don't want the Gazans to use the uh, and they don't want the Palestinian Authority to use the gas, mm. uh, which is our right. So and the whole world is. Um, uh, ally, allying uh, and um, and supporting Israel in that. So um, if we are talking with frustration is because we know that mm. politics is really um, the the art of uh, supporting the powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Um, does anyone want to add anything? Richard, do you want to add anything? Oh, you've got a cat. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, I know this is live, but when I see cats, I just I can't help myself. <laughs> In Turkey, you'll see many cats. Uh, uh, yes, I would say it's important to understand that the, after uh, World War I, uh, the peace diplomacy 
that followed shortly after the Balfour Declaration, which was issued in uh, 1917 during the war, uh, was not completely successful in establishing a British colony in Palestine. They, and the US under Woodrow Wilson was pressing for self-determination of peoples liberated from the Ottoman Empire. And what the international community ended up doing was to create this so-called mandate system, which gave Britain administrative rights, but supposedly as a sacred trust for the well-being of the people uh, that it was responsible for. And uh, this was a, a kind of halfway house between uh, colonialism and self-determination. But the uh, self-determination part was uh, really ignored. And so it, it didn't end up the way uh, this was sort of Wilsonian idealism, uh, which tried to check French and British ambitions in the Middle East, or at least moderate them. Uh, and that is a part of this story, and it's part of why Britain uh, sort of doesn't feel as guilty as it should feel, especially the British elite, uh, because they, and in the Balfour Declaration, there's a kind of clause that says nothing should be done that would hurt the interests of the non-Jewish communities. Uh, and again, that was uh, language that had no bearing on behavioral reality. Uh, and so it, it's a, uh, as all these uh, narratives of uh, national evolution tend to be, it uh, has complex uh, uh, patterns of uh, d disappointment and uh, uh, illusionary appeals that are never fulfilled. So, and, and I think Palestine's tragedy is one that is compounded by the idealistic elements in the international world, including the UN, as has been said. It's never, to, instead of being, it's accused of being a, an Israeli bashing organization, actually, it legitimated a colonial project at the great expense of human rights, of the self-determination, which was supposed to be the, the cardinal norm in the period uh, after uh, World War. Uh, Richard, you've just been muted. Uh, Perhaps your bad wonderful thing. cats have helped you with that. <laughs> I said a bad thing. <laughs> and, and the cats were like, no. no the um, cats mute me from time to time. Um, well, I was just going to say that uh, the complicity of the UN is an important uh, dimension of why this situation has been allowed to uh, uh, go so long without any kind of uh, adequate justice being uh, implemented. And hopefully, uh, as bad as things now appear, changes will happen as a result of continuing Palestinian resistance and a growing global solidarity movement. And one hopes a less uh, pro-Israeli successor to our current president, Trump. Uh, uh, since we mentioned the UN, um, I wanted to ask you more about your role at the UN um, and also what challenges you faced um, and why the UN has not been as helpful for the Palestinian cause. Uh, well, those are big questions, uh, but let me just uh, say my, my role as special rapporteur was to report on Israeli human rights violations uh, that were committed 
during the occupation. And uh, the, it's a position that is um, uh, within the scope of the activity of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, and is uh, these uh, special rapporteurs are appointed by consensus, which means you can't have any opposition uh, to your appointment. It's an unpaid position, but a position that, because it's unpaid, is not susceptible to UN uh, discipline. And even the UN Secretary General, in my case, said uh, he lacked the power to dismiss me, which was uh, uh, helpful in the sense of uh, reinforcing uh, my independence and at the same time getting him off the hook for not being able to carry out Washington's fond wishes not to have a critic of Israel in this position. And it is used, the reports that were issued uh, twice a year and given to the General Assembly in New York and the Human Rights Council in Geneva are probably the most comprehensive objective reporting that was relied upon by uh, many governments and NGOs, uh, important NGOs like the World Council of Churches and others. So uh, it was a taxing position because I was being attacked by Zionist uh, NGOs uh, that are very well organized in Geneva and uh, attacked me as a, a a militant anti-Semite and a self-hating Jew myself and a lot of other things. Uh, but I realized I was doing a reasonable job when the Weizmann Institute, an, a, a uh, pro-Zionist uh, organization that's located partly in Los Angeles and publishes each year a list of the 10 most dangerous anti-Semites in the world, listed me as third uh, and the only the only persons ahead of me were the uh, Prime Minister of Turkey and the Supreme Guide of Iran. So I realized at that point that this position must have a certain uh, impact, and I felt it worthwhile to continue. Um, and uh, just. Briefly, if you could tell us why the U, why your work at the UN um, hasn't been as fruitful as, I mean, not your work, I'm sorry, I'll rephrase that again. Why the UN is not offering the Palestinians the support that they so badly need? Well, you have to understand that the UN was created in a way that, that gave primacy to geopolitics rather than international law and human rights the veto power enjoyed by the five permanent members of the Security Council really in effect is saying these countries can do what they want. They don't have to be uh, subject to the discipline of law or the UN Charter or the General Assembly or other parts of the UN itself. They have the right to uh, veto any, any uh, policy or recommendation or decision that they find contrary to their interests. And this kind of geopolitical primacy has been part, was part, it's part of the constitutional structure of the UN. And therefore it's really not, you can't expect the UN to do more than it was empowered to do. And, and so one realizes that what it can do is change the discourse, but it can't change the behavior unless it ba is backed by the geopolitical forces at play. For instance, in 2011, when the geopolitical forces converged on uh, doing something to uh, about the Libyan uh, internal struggle, the UN was too effective. 
and ended up uh, supporting a regime-changing intervention in uh, Libya. It did the same thing in the first Gulf War uh, that uh, made Iraq uh, leave Kuwait. So the UN can be effective behaviorally if and only if the geopolitical forces uh, seek to implement uh, its political will. But if its political will goes against geopolitics, which solidarity with the Palestinian struggle has always done, then it is paralyzed at the behavioral level. You probably remember the Goldstone Report is a good example where the UN was able to establish a, a discourse on international and Israeli international criminality, but it couldn't follow the recommendations of the report, including reference to the International Criminal Court, because the uh, US was able to uh, block that kind of follow through. And so it's important to understand what the UN can do and what it can't do and try to change that balance a little bit uh, through uh, public opinion and uh, other forces. It also was possible in my uh, role to introduce both the language of colonialism and the language of apartheid uh, to describe uh, the occupation and also to anticipate the an annexation debate. In other words, it was clear that Israel was de facto annexing uh, large portions of the West Bank. And it only has become a kind of international issue when they tried to uh, extend their de jure sovereignty uh, to ratify what they had done uh, factually uh, for many years. So. There are many things that can be done, but not the things that in the end count the most for the people on the ground who are suffering from this status quo that has gone on far too long. Thank you for that. Thank you, Richard. And I ask about that. I ask about the UN because I feel like even even me before I started doing more digging and more research, you know, we assume that you know the International uh, the Criminal Justice Court, um, all these um, all these institutions work for us and, and they should protect all of us. When in fact, by meeting you and everybody else at the um, at ISKI at Queen Mary. We, we've become more enlightened with how geopolitics actually work. And you mentioned public opinion, you know, um, um, and I wanted to, to get, because it's all linked to theater, I believe, that in order to change public opinion, in order to uh, make sure that things are changed at a higher level in law, what we, ha we, ha we need people to form solidarity. And um, I wanted to open it up to Ashtar and to Mojisola um, about, this, the solidarity that we can create through political theater. I, I know that for us, you know, we're, we're a small company, but whenever we, we get responses from people, we, we see that we've, we've managed, you know, even if two or three people write to us or talk to us afterwards, we realize that, you know, solidarity happens at the grassroots. Um, and I was wondering what your experience was with this piece, because I know you've toured it quite a lot. Yeah, perhaps I could um, reflect a bit and uh, I'll be really interested to hear Edouard and Niman's um, memories as well of, of different responses to the piece in terms of solidarity. I suppose one thing to say is that the, the, the creation of this work is, is in itself uh, an act of solidarity. Um, it's, uh, we are in solidarity uh, with each other and um, that works in many directions. Um, so, um, you know, we can think, you know, think about, you know, the, the occupation of Palestine and the history that uh, Richard and Iman have so eloquently described, uh, also in terms of, in terms of racism. And um, so this, for me, the creation of this piece is absolutely an act of solidarity uh, as a black woman um, with Palestinian people. 
And there is, it also works both ways with Palestinian solidarity, with black people and with Black Lives Matter, for example, the, the movement at the moment. And, and um, the last uh, demonstration, a demonstration I was on in, in Berlin, in fact, I, of all places, um, there was a beautiful um, rally uh, there of Palestinians at the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstration. And I, you know, and, and I would encourage also uh, uh, black folk to to also stand in solidarity with Palestinians that we have much we we have much in common and and the roots uh, you know that which you described in terms of colonialism the, you know the, the roots are the same you know um, so the, you know the same powers that um, uh, you know um, put millions of us on slave ships and colonized lands uh, colonized the Palestinians is it, it, exactly the same and as it, and I suppose um. As people will hear from my accent, I'm British. I carry a British passport, um, and so it felt really important to me to be making this work um, because although um, my own uh, family, my Nigerian family, were colonised by the British, um, I still I carry that passport. So I carry the unwanted privileges of that passport. So it's my, I feel it's my um, my duty. Um, to use the power of that passport, the access that that passport gives me, to reflect the question back to Britain, um, and uh, to to you know to, to use the piece as a kind of as an active you know as an educational kind of piece as well. Most British people that I know, um, you know that I deal with, and then, and if I didn't realise which of the colleagues I also I work at Queen Mary. Um, when I'm not in Berlin, I'm a lecturer in the theatre department, drama department at Queen Mary University of London. Um, but most people that I would interact with, students and you know mature and educated people, um, don't know that you know the, the history of the Balfour Declaration. Or um, uh, when a, a friend of mine, a, an actor that's worked a lot with the Ashtar Theatre, showed me his um, his mother's passport, and his mother's passport is a Palestinian woman. It's the same as my passport. It's the same crest. It's the same lettering. The same everything. I remember taking pictures in Jerusalem of post boxes. There are still red post boxes that you get exactly the same as you get in London. And people saying to me, "How come they've got an English post box?" It's like, yeah, because it was a British. You know, it was under the British, you know, that people don't, you know, I mean, talk about educated people who don't know that kind of history. So I think, you know, just to create this piece of work and to collaborate across uh, across nations and across cultures is extremely important for, for theatre makers to just be in the room with each other and understand each other, learn from each other. I'm not the only person that's done that. Ashtar have collaborated with many people. Uh, Conor Morrison is a, is a very well-known um, theatre director from the north of Ireland. Um, really fascinating collaboration in terms of thinking about the north of Ireland and Palestine and um, those experiences coming together in a space. And... Um, and strategizing together creatively. So, uh, and I, I just want to publicly thank Ashtar as well for, for, for you know, I for saying yes to an idea that I had, because I because of that British passport. When I work internationally, I only go where I'm invited. I work a lot internationally, but I only go where I'm invited, and I try not to stay too long, um, because what the British did is they went where they weren't invited and they stayed too long. And they left a mess behind usually. So I only, you know, so I don't generally say to a theatre company, I've got an idea, do you want to work with me? But because I'd had this kind of longer relationship with Ashtar, I said, hey, uh, I have this idea. Do, do you want to, do you want to have, do you want to try it? And uh, Edward and Iman in the company uh, that Iman's mentioned, with some of the other artists involved, very important artists on this project. Said, said yes. And that was incredibly generous of them to say to a British person, yeah, come over here and make a show with us about occupation. I don't have a right, um, but they, uh, they, they, allowed, they allowed me that, that space because the, the purpose of this piece really is to try and educate people in Britain and in the United States and the rest of the world, uh, you know, about, about what occupation means in, in reality in a very embodied kind of way. So, so thank you, Iman and Edward and everyone at Ashton. Well, if I may add, uh, first, thank you, Mujusala. Of course, I mean, you are, what we feel towards you is that you are part of, of 
uh, the Ashtar family. So that goes without uh, any question. But um, I, I wanted to say that uh, Ashtar Theatre, since its establishment in 91, we had this idea of creating bridges with the world, with the theatre world, because we feel that we are part of one big family, which is the art family. We feel connected to every uh, theater maker that has um, um, a vision, that has uh, a, a message uh, of life and of humanity to uh, to present. So uh, we've been working with Manjusola, with uh, um, Michael Walling, with uh, um, Barbara Santos, with many, many uh, uh, big, great, wonderful artists uh, from UK, from Berlin, from Ireland, from the Germany. US, uh, from Germany. Uh, and and we feel that uh, we, um, like this relationship is really building um, an insight to us and to them, to our people and to the people where uh, from where they are, as well as it, it creates a uh, great empathy um, of, uh, of our um, human essence. It, because at the end of the day, we are all human beings and we are working for the best of um, what humanity should be. And so um, we have a responsibility towards our students because we are a theater school as well. We have a responsibility towards the, the new generation um, to, um, to make them aware uh, of, uh, of the history and of the atrocity uh, and the atrocities that is happening in Palestine, but also the atrocities that is happening to uh, um, black people, for example, uh, in uh, with Black Life Matter, uh, to uh, people, uh, under uh, different um, occupation and oppression. Um, but um, to go back to what this particular play have done, um, everywhere we have taken uh, this play, had uh, it generated um, a, a big discussion. People were really touched by it. People, people accepted what what we've been presenting. Of course, some people were skeptical as well, or some uh, some asked questions and some said, oh, but this is not the, uh, the for reality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but they accepted what we have presented. They respected what we have presented because the, it resonated with them because it doesn't only show uh, the Palestinian uh, Israeli um, the conflict and the, the occupation, it also presents a conflict between gender. It, it, and it is a very um, uh, big issue there because it, I mean, colonialism is man-made politics. It's not a woman-made politics. So we want to say that oppressed are mostly women and uh, um, Palestinians and other people around the world. So there is a duty uh, on, on our shoulder as artists to raise our voices right and to say what is right and what is wrong in, in, in this life. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we do want uh, the international um, artists and communities and, and people uh, of, um, uh, of empathy <laughs> towards sensitive issues uh, to back us up because we are continuously um, attacked and, and sometimes we are um, physically attacked or we are shot at, we are imprisoned, but sometimes we are even more attacked when we are attacked with our um, narrative because that destroys the history, because that changes the nature of life. Because uh, as much as the uh, religions have done to pre-religion uh, um, and to, um, to mythologies, 
around uh, our uh, world and in in the world in general um, politics of, of today is doing the same thing towards uh, um, um, native people of native places thank you so much for that. very much is very much needed between the people Absolutely. Your, your words ring so true. And uh, I completely agree. I think we can all agree um, that that is exactly what we need and that it is our duty at art, as artists. And we feel exactly the same way. This is part of why uh, Google exists, uh, to, to spark these conversations and to show people what political theatre is, could be, and what it could achieve. Um, now, um, sorry, yes. We shouldn't be uh, ashamed that we're doing political theater because that's also one more thing that is being fought against. I mean, um, I mean, we're not really doing uh, cheap or bad uh, quality theater. We're doing theater with with good quality, but we have political messages, and we're proud of putting our politics on stage as well. Absolutely, it's not a compromise. It's not a compromise at all. Um, I, I'm really sorry, but it's been such an incredible conversation that we haven't actually got to all of the questions that I had prepared, not to mention having time for audience questions. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask if anyone wants to say any final remarks just before we end. Just I, I would like to congratulate the, those that made this theater work possible and hope that they will continue with this uh, way of resisting uh, terrible crimes done to the Palestinian people. And thank you for moderating, Cesar. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I want to say thank you for everyone who invited us to perform this show around the world, because this show was played about 200 times already in 2010. And I want to just to say something, in our last show in New Mexico, one of the audiences came to me after the show and he told me, you are a great actor, but I hate you. And he started to <laughs> cry and he said, I am very sorry. I understood every movement that you have done, but we cannot help you because our government is against you Palestinians. And he was crying. <laughs> uh. Besides saying thank you, um, I mean, uh, to you, Cinziana, Claire, and uh, Angel, um, and all the people who were uh, with us today, Mojisola and Richard, of course, um, I would really would, would like, um, it, it, this is like an open invitation for whoever is uh, hearing us tonight. Um, uh, or today, <laughs> it depends on the hour. Um, but uh, Come to Palestine. Our doors are open. We at Ashtar Theatre, we would like to create cultural bridges because that's the only way we can create justice in the world. Thank you. I highly recommend <laughs> that trip. <laughs> uh, I, I first went to work with Ashtar, I think it was 1997. And um, yeah, I have a look back. It was a huge uh, education for me and continues to be. And an education not just in politics, but in, it, in art um, and an absolutely life changing experience. Um, and yeah, and just to absolutely support what Iman says, you know, and what I, you know, the, the sentiment of these discussions that you've created. And thank you so much for setting this up um, as well. Um, uh, that. Um, it's, you know, art, culture, theatre, music, it's one of the few ways we can, um, we can uh, cross those bridges and, um, and, and understand conflict and understand war and understand injustice and understand occupation and educate ourselves without picking up a weapon. You know, um, it's extremely powerful. And if it wasn't so powerful, um, governments wouldn't try to repress the media governments wouldn't try to repress um, the arts. All oppressive governments try to repress and curtail the arts and media and news. Um, so uh, it's, it's powerful work we're doing here. 
Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, get to Palestine. You might struggle getting in, you might struggle getting out, but it's absolutely worth the experience. Um, and thank you so much for this, this discussion. It's been completely inspirational and, and empowering. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Iman. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Mojisola. Um, and also thank you to, to the people watching. Uh, I want to remind you that if you want to, to support Ashtar, you can by donating. There will be a link that pops up and it will be in the event. I, I really suggest that you do because they're making incredible work in, in incredible circumstances. So they really need the support and your love. Um, and I want to end by inviting everyone to join us in two weeks time for the next event, uh, which will be uh, Revenge uh, by Laura Uribe from Mexico. It is a play about the microaggressions and the microviolence in, in our family that turn into macro violences on a societal level. And it's an incredible piece of work um, that I really recommend you come back and watch and with a discussion afterwards as you are used to by now. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and see you on the, 7th, uh, the 14th of September, hopefully, if you can make it. Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're no longer live. <laughs>